Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first CLM webinar of 2024. Um, I'll be hosting today. My name is Amber Emmons. I am a water quality associate. Um, I work in the counties Wood, Henry, and Ottawa here. And today we will be talking about manure safety, emergency responses, and um, proper ways to handle it. So a little bit about the water quality team. If you haven't joined us for one of these previously, you might not know who we are. Um, we cover Northwest Ohio here in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, Rachel Cochran works in the Paulding, Vranwort, and Defiance counties, as you can see in the orange. Jocelyn Burt is our water quality associate down in All Glaze, Allen, and Mercer counties in purple. And Paige Garibrandt is Putnam, Hancock, and Hardin, which is that light blue kind of color. Um, Matt Romanko works in Crawford, Wyandotte, Seneca, Sandusky, and Erie, which is a nice green color on our map. I, like I said myself, am in Henrywood and Ottawa, and then we currently have a vacant position there in the Williams, Fulton, and Lucas, but we will be looking to hire for someone for that. And they are likely on this webinar today and will be helping me out. So this is a series. We do offer the Certified Livestock Manager webinars uh, bi-monthly. So, and they are the first Monday of the ever other, every other month. So here, this one's in February, the next one will be April 1st, and then we'll have June 3rd, August 5th, and so on. Um, we don't have any speakers or topics lined up for that yet, but stay tuned. We will have flyers uh, circulating when we do have those things lined up for those future webinars. Um, the water quality team also hosts water quality Wednesday webinars. We do those just over the winter, early spring. We had our first one last week at the end of January um, because they are the last Wednesday of the month. So the next one will be Wednesday, February 28th at the end of this month, which the uh, topic for that one is drainage water man management and wetlands. And then the next one after that will be on March 27th featuring cascading waterways as the topic. And you'll have speakers um, from Ohio State, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, ODA, Ohio Department of Agriculture, and the Nature Conservancy for those webinars. So stay tuned if you'd like. Um, those links should be posted in the chat soon by one of the other water quality associates if you guys are interested for re registering for those. So today's webinar, like I said, is a little bit about manure and several things about manure. Our speakers today are Glenn Arnold. He's a OSU field specialist in nutrient management systems. Then we have uh, Luke Dole. He's with ODA. And then we'll lastly end with John Flegel um, with Ohio EPA. And I have all their contact information at the end if we have any um, questions for them. And we will take any questions at the end. Luke will take questions at the end of his uh, talk, though, because he will have to hop off after that. And as we get started, um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. We will be monitoring that and we will ask those questions either after Luke's talk or for Glenn and John at the end. So first up, like I said, we have Glenn Arnold. I will stop sharing my screen. He can start sharing his and we will hear from him. Okay, Amber, does the screen look good to you? Looks good to me. You should be all good, set to go. Okay. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. <clears throat> all three of us are going to talk about uh, emergency responses. Uh, we all come at it from a little bit of a different angle. Uh, and we do it primarily from Ohio State from an educational point of view. So uh, we're going to go ahead and hopefully I can forward... It's not allowing me to forward my screen. Do I need to wait till the poll is over with Amber? Um, I don't think that should, I have much, I don't know. Um, I had to click on the arrows at the bottom of my slideshow for it to go forward. Bottom left-hand corner wasn't the arrows for me otherwise. Hmm, not seeing them. Oh, okay, done. hey, there it's moving go. now. Well, there's three primary places that we're going to get manure escapes from from uh, agriculture. Uh, Kevin Erb has said this a number of times from um, Missouri or University of Wisconsin. One of those is from the field during the application process. Doesn't necessarily have to be a, an accident here. 
but could be over application, but this is one time uh, you usually can get manure runoff from fields and that's where we have issues. A second one that we can run into is during the transportation of the manure. It could be uh, in a hose like this, uh, perhaps develop a leak as it goes under a road, perhaps burst as it lays close to a ditch someplace. It could be a manure tanker that overturns during transport, or maybe they just forgot to shut the valve all the way and they literally drip manure from um, the source out to the field. So there's lots of different ways it can occur. And the third one is primarily at the uh, source of manure, the storage. And on this one, uh, this is a farmer who's getting ready to do a plot and um, do some manure application. He puts his chopper pump in to agitate the pit in advance. And what happens is that the top blew off. And this, this pump had about uh, probably 15 minutes of running before anybody realized what was going on. And by that time, of course, it had pumped a substantial amount of manure up into the attic of the building. And then also, you can see where the brown is in the yard. You can see how much manure would have been uh, uh, built up there. But of course, there's a drainage ditch right there. You can see that's a, a man-made drainage ditch. And then you obviously know that's going to go to a lower part of the field. And this is a good example. This is uh, that manure accumulated in the yard until it found an outlet to flow and then it flowed toward a ditch. And th that tree line is essentially a ditch. And the equipment you see there, the farmer has a field cultivator that he's already run across here and down further below. And then he took a skid steer and built a dam to try to contain the manure. And here's what the dam looked like after we finally got the manure shut off. Uh, then we began the containment and eventually the cleanup and the mitigation of the, of the ditch water. It gets you know, depending on how deep you build your dam, it can get quite deep. And uh, just an example of uh, corn disappearing into the manure pond that we built. In this instance, as in other instances, there was a catch basin close enough by. By the time it got here, it was too late to contain, but you can slow it down, of course. And had we been better prepared that day, we probably could have had something like a piece of plywood that lay across a catch basin, maybe put down some... Uh, plastic like a tarp or something and then put sandbags on top and that would have been a way to have slowed that down so that you can get ahead of it because eventually you want to be able to contain that manure if it does reach a stream you want to be able to contain that that contaminated water i've got down here know what equipment's available and how to get it he got on a cell phone uh, had neighbors and relatives one brought a bobcat over pretty quickly to supplement the uh skid steer we already had. Of course, they used that to reinforce the dam that they built and to uh, dig a sump for pumping out of later on. There's a picture of a dam that was built uh, in a pretty good hurry, but it did the job. That day of this spill, there was almost no water flow through this ditch whatsoever. It was a pretty dry June period. And so by damming that up, even though this liquid on the right-hand side is getting close to two, three feet deep. Uh, there really is nothing on the left-hand side. And dams can be built out of anything. Um, this happened to be a dam that uh, Francis Springer built um, as we were doing a demonstration last fall. And you can see we built it out of, she has a row of bales that have a metal stake down through them, a fence post. Then we have these hog panels that we got from the county fairgrounds and then a ro another row of um, straw bales behind there. And again, if you're going to do this in a ditch, you've got to expect that there'll be a push against this stuff. So that's why you have to add the reinforcing to uh, get it to hold back things the way you want it to. Of course, in the uh, field itself, after they built the dam, of course, they dug a sump. And another neighbor came over with a suction pipe on a tanker. And he was making trips back uh, to some wheat field, or excuse me, some uh, hay field that he had and was getting rid of this manure. At a field day we had last summer, we also had this septic tank pumper that came from uh, a dairy in Paulding County. And that's a really nice unit he's got. Now, again, he doesn't have unlimited capacity back here on the left-hand side, but still the ability to reach down into a ditch or reach into a a um, coffer dam that's been built with a sump area in it 
it's a good thing to have. So again, there's a lot of these different designs out there and many in the commercial mineral applicator industry and many in the uh, livestock industry have been buying these so that they've got them just in case it's ever needed. Despite all the efforts that day, the manure did reach the, the ditch. And again, it was a low flow ditch. He's got it plugged up, but it's filling uh, slowly with manure. And then of course, there's the aquatic damage that's done, the crawdads, the fish, uh, other things that were in the ditch, uh, all were, were killed because the BOD of manures were very high. And that BOD is a biological oxygen demand. So basically the ammonia in the hog manure is combining with the water and these creatures are all suffocated. Eventually the farmer, after getting a sump dug and getting things hooked up again, here he is just pumping it back out. So we've got water flow coming to the dam that he built and you've got um, the sump pump rigged or you've got the suction pump rigged and it's basically going to pump that out. And what's what are we doing with it? Well, there's a number of choices, but this choice this day is he could put it back out on the field. So the commercial applicator that was doing going to do the manure application anyhow is pulling from a ditch. Manure spills are highly stressful. Everybody's on edge because um, you know it's just a stressful situation. There's going to be investigations, going to be potential fines, going to be potential this or that then the embarrassment of having done it. So there's just a lot of uh, stress on those types of days. And um, it's it's great if people can, can maintain a calm head, uh, work together, get this resolved. So he's just basically land applying the manure that he's pumping back out of the ditch. And for every gallon that you got into the ditch, you're probably gonna pump a hundred gallons back out. So it wouldn't surprise me to see a person over the course of a day when they've had a manure spill, pump maybe a million gallons out of a ditch. It really can, can add up depending on the ditch flow and stuff. Now, as I said earlier, this ditch in this day was very slow flowing. So basically the farmer had some people bring semi tankers of water in and add to the ditch. So two purposes of that, one, you're adding fresh water to a ditch. So you're mitigating some of the issue that you've got. And then secondly, and more importantly to him that in that particular time was he's getting liquid to push the manure to to carry the manure down to his sump where he could pump it back onto the field. So it had a number of semi tankers deliver water. Again, it's good to have names and numbers of people who would have such equipment. And then also the fire department came by and, and dumped a tanker load of water for him. So again, um, again, we're adding water to Two purposes there. One is to add oxygen and water to the to the ditch. And secondly, give him more volume that he can pump out the remaining parts of the manure. Here's the second one. Um, dairy farmer woke up in the morning. He had a, had a five inch rain the night before. He had uh, his pond in the very back was almost, well, was completely full. And then that rain caused that pond to flow back through his barn. In this instance, you can see where he made good use of round bales to plug off a ditch. Again, you use whatever you've got handy. And even though uh, he may not have had an emergency plan, he went in here with these large round bales and stopped up the ditch. And then he took some dirt that he pushed up out of the field right beside there and then made a better dam yet. So this enabled him to get that uh, flow stopped in that particular situation. This is just an example. This is another tile that came off the farm lot. And um, the farmer put a plug in there shortly after that. And as soon as he got his plug done, uh, you get into a situation where it found another place to go. Here that manure is bubbling up out of the ground right above where he put the tile plug in. And if you've ever left tile plugs in fields, you know this will happen even with regular rainwater coming down. And you can see it's just following his tracks back there and then eventually it's gonna find a place to jump back into the field tile or into the ditch. So again, it's one of those things where it's hard to remain calm in these situations, but you've got to methodically look for all the places that you've got manure getting away and you gotta get it contained as best you can. This is familiar, basically a temporary sump built right in front of those bales of hay. This farmer has, in this particular instance, this is a hose clamp 
So this, he can clamp this every time because he's got a load stand filling semis, but he can clamp this so he doesn't get any backflow once he's get, once he's, uh, the semi is full and they need to change semis, he can clamp this hose off um, so that we don't get a lot of backflow back into the ditch. And then there are the semis lined up to be loaded. Again, he's taken that. You know, who would you take manure to if you had to in an emergency? Probably another dairy neighbor. And that's what they are in this situation. Somebody whose pond is lower and can handle the liquid. And then a coarse field tile plugs are helpful to have. This is one that uh, was put in downstream before the, where the water went under a uh, roadway. So again, you can plug that off. And even though this water has not been contaminated with the manure, it's good to put those in place just in case some other upstream dam gives way to you. Then if you get manure in the, on the roads and stuff, uh, it's helpful to have the fire department come by and get that cleaned back off for you. So that's what you've got in this instance. You've got uh, two people from the fire department that are washing off the highway or the uh, county road where the manure would have been seeping out overnight. Now, when you look at your stream contamination or your stream mitigation, especially the water quality, there's lots and lots and lots of ways that you can look at that. But, but one thing you want to do is you want to try to get the air into the water and you want to try to get oxygen into the water and you want to try to get ammonia out of the water. So a lot of commercial applicators uh, have in their toolbox either a homemade bubbler or something similar. This is simply a 10 foot long pipe. It's about two inches by two inches. It's got end on here and he can, the commercial applicator can hook a hose up to it or an air hose and make it bubble. And again, many commercial applicators have different ones of this. This is just one example. You can see how it's bubbling. I just have this one today hooked up to a small air compressor. You can imagine how much more it would bubble if this thing had been hooked up to a three or 400 CFM uh, air compressor like the commercial applicators have to blow out their lines and their hoses. But if you can leave this run and leave it and run for hours, it will help with mitigation of the water. It will help get oxygen into the water, get, get the ammonia out of the water and to improve over time. The more you can pump in, the better you are on the oxygen and the air and stuff. This is just another example of how you might mitigate water. I've just put a trash pump right here into a ditch. And this again was a practice one, but it would work in real life as well. Well, sorry about that. It would work in real life as well. So you've got a um, discharge hose coming over here. We simply went up and hung that into a tree or a stump and we're shooting the water back into the ditch. So again, we're aerifying this, we're getting rid of ammonia, we're getting uh, oxygen picked up, we're going back into the ditch with it. And again, letting this run for hours and hours and hours would be one of the methods you would look at for stream water uh, mitigation. Again, we're trying to do all we can to restore the stream. We're pumping out the uh, manure, we're adding oxygen back to the water and uh, adding additional water to the ditch to help on all of those responses. And there are also times when you'll want to put a dam not only downstream on a, on a ditch like this, perhaps also upstream, because there are times when you've got a ditch that's, that's got maybe a source of groundwater that's feeding it or other some other source that you don't want to keep having to pump um, millions of gallons out of a ditch if, uh, if it's not necessary. So there may be times when you'd actually want to put a, a dam in both above and below stream where there's been a spill. When I think of, of um, the steps a person would want to follow, I just want to emphasize nobody is calm, cool, and collected when there's a, a spill. It's always um, one of everyone's biggest concerns when we handle manure. And there's going to be spills because there's no such thing as 100% all the time. And these spills could either be operator error, or in some instances, they can be equipment failures. And equipment failures are pretty hard to predict if uh, everything looks good when you're using it. And then you, you break an axle and you roll a tanker or you have something else that goes wrong. Just like that farmer early on that blew the uh, cap off of his recirculation pump. 
again, he was doing a good job. He was trying to churn up the uh, manure so they were getting even application of his phosphorus. And then he, he got penalized by a, by a break of a piece of equipment. So have, have a plan for emergencies. You're going to need cell phones of people who have equipment that you would need. Or if you're by yourself, you might need more than one person in the field to pull off some of the things you want to accomplish there. And the equipment. I once had a speaker that once talked about a farmer who learned a lesson one time where he needed his a piece of tillage equipment really rapidly to till an area between his manure pond and a ditch about 100 year, yards away. And it wasn't overflowing. It was just that a uh, muskrat had dug down into his pond. The pond found that opening and began to leak out one day. And the farmer said when he went to grab his tillage equipment, he found out it was behind the combine, behind, behind a couple of headers and a baler. So his tillage equipment was not out where he could get a hold of it in a hurry. So that's something you might want to give some thought. Not only what equipment you'll need is Will it be near the front of the machine shed or will it be next to a machine shed where you can really get your hands on it in a hurry? Then the second thing I've got is do all you can to contain the manure in the field. Um, Luke will probably have some pictures on that too, but your, your goal is to not get it into the ditch. If you can keep it on the field itself, then it's not a manure spill. It's just a manure release that just hasn't reached a ditch or stream. So it's not actually a violation of any sort but you want to do all you can to uh, contain that on the field. If the manure reaches a waterway, you then want to try to contain um, the ditch or the stream or whatever source it is and be prepared to pump it out. It's going to take a lot to do that, but be prepared to do it. And then you want to do it. You want to mitigate the water. You want to remove ammonium. You want to add oxygen. You want to do all you can to um, be sure that things are addressed as they should be. And then lastly, be sure the proper agencies are contacted. Um, your soil and water office is usually the first step for the majority of uh, livestock producers in the state of Ohio. If you're permitted, I'm sure Luke's going to be your first step or ODA, um, perhaps the livestock permitted division. But you really want to make sure that you don't forget to uh, reach out to those groups. Nobody likes to find out later or afterwards that there's a big manure spill and it wasn't cleaned up. You know, we, we have enough people in the state to keep an eye on uh, those types of things. Uh, we have enough neighbors that uh, would report, you know, anything that's um, done poorly. So I think you need to make a good faith effort to really do a good job on your manure containment and get it uh, taken care of. And that pretty much, Amber, is what I had to talk about today. And I think we're going to have questions at the end of the day, if I remember right. Yes, we'll take questions at the end. So if anybody has any questions for Glenn, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We will take them all at the end and we can answer any of your thoughts. Um, next up, we will have Luke. Um, if he's ready to share his screen, I can pull this down real quick and we can have him go where we'll talk about proper manure practices. All right, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. And I can see your slide. I can see in my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Glenn, for that. Um, a lot of great info there. Um, I'm going to kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how we avoid that, um, you know, having to clean up spills and, and, uh, Pump, uh, pump manure out of the creek, things like that. Um, so, um, as I said, things we saw um, with the ODA, uh, Division of Livestock Environmental Permitting. Uh, we are the division that uh, that implements the CLM program, and, uh, and so we're pretty heavily involved with that. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in Montgomery County um, on a permanent farm. Uh, so we did uh, fair to finish swine. Um, had about 450 steers and then found about 3,900 acres, uh, all kinds of different uh, crops. We did uh, seed corn, seed beans, all kinds of other field crops. So um, pretty well versed in, uh, before I came to ODA, I was pretty well versed in, in the permitting process and rules and regulations, things like that. Um, currently live in Miami County and uh, been with the division for three years. Um, and so enjoying my time here. Um, 
So I'm going to talk just a bit, uh, like I said, um, the manure spill prevention. Um, so we're going to talk, talk a bit about maintenance. Um, Glenn kind of talked about, you know, we can have the best intentions and, and inspections and all kinds of stuff on our, on our equipment, and, and sometimes things go wrong, but we want to make sure that we're uh, putting ourselves in the best position for that. Um, and then we're going to talk about just planning, um, so a lot of different things there, and then uh, at the end, kind of wrap up with um, just a brief discussion on frozen snow-covered ground conditions when we're applying manure. Um, and so, um, hitting on uh, maintenance inspections, um, a lot of these things I, I think are no-brainers, but um, as we get in busy seasons, we can, we can definitely um, get to a spot where, where some of this stuff is neglected. And so, just some basic things, um, making sure we're keeping up on regular maintenance. Working lights is a big one. Um, like I said, I grew up on a farm. We applied, I applied all the liquid manure um, on our farm. And so I, I drove the tankers there. That's a picture of our tanker um, sitting there in the field. Um, you know, and even with working lights and, and um, you know, flashers and blinkers and everything else, you know, those of you guys who, who drive equipment and, and trucks on the, on the road, um, you know, people get kind of twitchy around around equipment and you know i can't count the amount of times that that people tried to pass me while i was pulling into a field even though all my blinkers worked and things like that so obviously those things are going to happen but we've got to make sure that we're putting ourselves in the in the best position for um for success so making sure that all that kind of stuff works good tires on trucks and tractors things like that um you know the big ones some of the big ones really um making sure that we're inspecting um, and maintaining hoses, connections, couplers, things like that. Um, and, and so we, we know that everything's in working order, you know, when we put it through a culvert under the road, when we're running them through, through a creek and then back up to the field, we just, um, you know, making sure that we're all, um, all set to go there and in the best position possible. Um, so this is, this is just a real uh, brief example, um, a facility that I had, they had a, uh, they had a hose running through that culvert um, that's shown uh, shown right here, um, and it just it popped right. Uh, I think it maybe had been um, rubbing on the concrete a little bit um, is is kind of what we've narrowed it down to. But but it popped. They were monitoring everything very close. Got the pump shut off right away. They had um, some of those clamps. I think uh, Glenn had a photo with one on it. Um, they were to clamp everything off real quick. They had sand um, available. They were right there next to the dairy. Um, so they were able to dam everything off real quick. They were, uh, you know, and most of that was due to the fact that they were monitoring their equipment and making sure that, uh, that they were keeping up with things. You know, this is an example that, uh, you know, an accident, you know, accidents happen. Um, but how well prepared are we to catch them quick? Um, and then, you know, and then take the necessary steps to, uh, to minimize the effects. And so this ended up, um, you know, they maybe had manure in about 150 feet of this ditch, uh, pumped it out real quick, flushed clean water through it. Um, and now you, you never know that it, that it happened. They did a great job cleaning it up. And, and that was due to some of that, I think, monitoring and, and just keeping an eye on, on equipment. Um, talking about just planning ahead, um, as you're just driving, um, or, you know, as you're hauling manure, um, down the road to different spots. Um, it's important to check. Keep in mind, you know, the intersections and, and turns that you got to make, making sure that you can see, that people can see you. Um, and then, uh, you know, intersections that you've got to make a turn, you know, making sure that they're accessible. You know, this, this picture here on the right is uh, uh, a belt trailer that was, uh, was hauling uh, poultry litter. Um, wasn't able to make the turn and uh and the wheels um you know his, his rear axle ended up sliding down in the ditch and then and then upset it there um and so it's just a a small ditch here that uh we brought an excavator in and and scraped it out and everything was fine but you know that could have probably been avoided um with just a little bit maybe more careful planning on how we're going to get to the field um and i feel driveways there you know some of those can be you know, not, not ideal. And so just making sure we're keeping an eye on how we're getting in the field, how accessible they are. Uh, those are all important things. Um, and then transfer locations. Um, a lot more guys are, um, 
are using the frac tanks. The commercial liquid ap applicators are using the frac tanks. And so, um, you know, identifying any potential issues, um, you know, if you do have some spills, if you are, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the hoses aren't connected as tight as they could be, if you've got some leaks and things like that, you've got to make sure that you're identifying um, any potential issues and then um, and having something on hand um, in the event. Um, in the event of a spill is always going to be crucial there, but, but planning ahead, looking at, you know, where, where's the best place, you know, where's the best place to set this frac tank, not only in terms of um, pumping, you know, as far as you, as far as you need to and having access to the, to the acreage that you're applying to, but then also um, just from an environmental impact standpoint, um, making sure that you're kind of planning ahead and, and looking at that. Um, being familiar with the field that you're in, um, you know, each, each and every field that you pull into is, is going to be unique, obviously. And so understanding where we have ditches, creeks, waterways, and some of the big ones are, are there's catch basins, pile breeders, inlets, things like that, that, um, that might not be as obvious. And, um, and at CLM, you know, we, we are required, you, know, you are required to, to follow this, uh, the setbacks that are laid out here in this appendix. Um, and, you know, just a brief look through it, you know, we have uh, staging area, stockpile, surface application, winter applications, which we'll talk a little bit about later, and then surface incorporation within 24 hours or direct injection. Um, these are things that you have to keep in mind. You've got to plan ahead for so that, you know, so that your applicators, if you're not the one in the tractor, you, you've got to make sure that your applicators are aware of where these um, potential areas are and then how, how far back they need to, uh, they need to stay from those. Um, one important consideration that I've run into several times with setbacks in, in terms of planning to avoid uh, confusion or, or, you know, to avoid discharges, things like that, is if you look column two and column four, surface application and incorporation and injection. So from wells and from neighboring residences, if you're surface applying, it's 300 feet for both of those. If you're going to incorporate or direct inject, that setback distance goes down to 100 feet. And so those are important things to keep in mind if you're applying for, if you're custom applying for someone, um, making sure that you have an agreement or an understanding that if you're going to go 100 feet, if you're going to surface apply 100 feet um, from a house, they need to make sure, the farmer needs to make sure that he's aware that you're out there and that, that's, and that that gets incorporated uh, within 24 hours to avoid any potential, um, not only uh, violation, but um, to avoid any potential um, discharges um, or anything like that. And so those are things to consider um, as you're planning ahead, as you're looking at setbacks and each individual site, uh, we want to make sure that we're um, taking a look at those things and being aware. Um, as far as planning rates, um, one of the big drivers here is available water capacity. Um, so, so, which is a fancy way of just saying, you know, how much water is in the soil and, you know, what are those general soil conditions? You know, we tend to Think of things as being well if it's too wet we don't want to get out there kind of thing but there are also considerations for if it's too dry do we have soil cracks um this picture here this is a photo i took last um last summer um walking through we were trying to there was a, a discharge that happened we were trying to kind of figure out what exactly happened and as i walked through this bean field this was a tire track uh sprayer track i believe um, where they had driven consistently, you know, a couple of times that year. And so these cracks, I, I had another photo, I didn't include it. Um, they were wide enough that I could put, um, I could put two of my fingers down inside of it. And so those are, um, those are conditions that we need to, um, we need to identify as we're um, talking about general soil conditions and, and planning our rates and how we're going to do things. Um, uh, that on our on the next slide here, I'll, I've got some some rates and things wrote out on our available water capacity chart. Um, but something to consider uh, as a CLM 
uh, if there's a field that has subsurface tile, um, your maximum rate gallons per acre is limited to about 13,500. Um, and that's across, you know, that's across anything. That's, that's your maximum rate for a single application. So that's something you got to keep in mind as well. Do you, do you have sub, subsurface drainage, you know, those, as you, as you look at each individual site. Um, and then we also have a resource, um, appendix A, table one, uh, to one of the rules that, uh, that just talks about soil prone to flooding is an important thing to consider. Um, again, each individual site, where are we at? Um, what kind of soil conditions? And, uh, and location are we dealing with. Um, now there are, you know, today we're talking about avoiding discharges, avoiding overloading soils, um, you know, just with, with the material itself, there are other factors obviously that go into uh, how we plan our rates, you know, some of those, you know, when we look at soil samples, manure samples, nutrient load, um, crop removal and rotation, all those things are gonna play into it. Um, but for today's for today's talk, we're just kind of talking about um, rates as far as I'm concerned with just the amount of material that we're putting out. Um, other considerations for planning your rates and, and how much material you're going to put out. Obviously, if, if there's cover crop, if there's growing crop, um, you know what's that? What are those growing crops going to utilize um, right away as far as you know soaking up material and um, and the moisture that's out there? Talking about liquid application. Um, and then also, you know, if we're, if we're out there in the fall on crop residue, you know, it, it, it tends to look a lot different when we get out and apply liquid manure to, say, a field that corn silage was removed um, compared to um, something that's either got a, a growing cover crop or maybe, uh, maybe soybean stubble. Um, you know, that can feel quite a bit different when we're talking about how many, how many thousands of gallons we're going to put out per acre. So those are all things to consider as well, uh, looking, looking, uh, Site by site. So, again, this is uh, the available water oops, sorry, the available water capacity chart. Um, you know, it's going to tell you type of soil that we have at the top. You know, where I'm from, we've got a lot of clay, and so I'm going to probably use this. Um, I'm going to use this chart down here, and um, and then just looking down, um, these are your percentages. And then each one describes, um, you know, when you dig down eight inches, you were looking at that whole profile, you know, what, how does that soil act in your hand? Um, and it's going to kind of tell you uh, the different rates, uh, down breaker that you're, that, are, that you're going to be able to put on to reach, um, to reach full capacity uh, for that, for that specific soil. And so, um, but once again, you know, okay, 27,000 gallons we got listed here. For single applications, probably probably not going to be feasible um, for several different reasons. One of them, okay, if we go down, this is the note. Um, if we've got subsurface tile, uh, you know, this is your max, seventeen or thirteen five. Um, but then also talking about some of those other factors, you know, your soil samples, your subsurface tile, uh, crop needs, things like that. That's going to also determine the rate. But as far as the soil condition, this kind of gives you an idea of um, of what you might be looking at. Um, injection and incorporation, planning ahead, how you're going to handle each one. Um, subsurface placement of manure, obviously that's going to um, ideally help with any kind of um, surface flow, concentrated surface flow. Um, there, there is an element to that um, where if, you, uh, if you've got some hills and some slopes and fields, you can get some manure that, you know, as you, as you go up a hill, that manure is you know, maybe going to move back through the furrow, move, you know, move down to that low point and then bubble up on the surface and then we get um, maybe some ponding and manure. So we do have to, um, we do have to consider that as we're, as we're looking at how much manure we're going to put on. That can obviously cause some, cause some issues if we get a rain event, um, any kind of ponding manure we want to avoid. Um, and then we can also, you know, if, if you do have a lot of soil cracking, if you're going to inject your manure, um, obviously that's putting it um, a little bit closer to the tile, and, and so you might run into some issues with um, some of that preferential flow um, through those cracks to the tile. And so those are things to consider you know, as we look, you know, again talking about soil condition. You know, what's it really look like out there, and what's the best method that we can use? Um, incorporation. 
got guys that, that will work um, work an area before or after um, manure gets applied. Um, either way, either way is is a good method to uh, to help, uh, especially with liquid, help that uh, that liquid get soaked up uh, into the soil. Um, you know, if you do go out there and and scratch the surface ahead of time, you can really eliminate uh, the cracking and some of those preferential flows. So that can be um, that can be of a benefit uh, to keep the manure in the in the soil and field. Um, as far as the definition of incorporation, we try not to be too um, too tight with that. But generally, the way we think about it is um, is um, the manure, the material. Um, being thoroughly mixed with the top two to four inches of soil. And so if, if you've got an opportunity where you're talking about, we're going to, you know, like I said, we're going to definitely comments on frozen and soak up the ground. We want to make sure that if we're going to say that we're going to incorporate it after the fact, um, we want to be able to make sure that we can get two to four inches down there and really mix that soil up. Um, you know, this, uh, this toolbar here at the, uh, top right, obviously, um, he's really turning up some dirt behind that tanker. Um, that's probably, I'm guessing maybe that's a, like a magnum plow type tool bar system, um, uh, where he's really, he's really working, um, a lot of that dirt up. And so, and so that's, that's a, that's one way to go, but it's, you know, obviously if you've got guys that prefer minimum tillage or no till, um, you know, we're not going to be able to do things like that. So again, you know how many practices, how many how many different methods do we have at our disposal, um, and what what's the unique situation that we're in? What's unique about the site that we're that we're at, and and how can we prevent? Um, how can we use all these tools to uh, to prevent a discharge um, or any manure movement? Uh, this is an example. Um, it's hopefully clear on your screen. Um, this was an instance where uh, we got called out. Um, it was a question of whether or not the ground was frozen or not. And it was, um, it was an application, a solid manure application where um, there was a pretty, there was really, really thick coverage um, that they, that they had on the field an inch or two of coverage um, on top of the soil. They went back with, with like a, a, some kind of a speed disc and said that they incorporated it. But uh, at closer look, um, really what it did was it, it made, you can see sort of these furrows here. All it did was make furrows through the manure and was unable to actually penetrate the ground. Um, and so none of the dirt was actually turned over. None of the manure was actually mixed with any of the soil. And so, um, and so that was really determined to be, um, to just be surface applied. It wasn't incorporated. And so again, going back to uh, soil conditions, weather conditions, um, are we gonna be able to really work this in, um, those are important questions to ask because then in, in this instance, um, this was I think sometime in, in January, not this year, I can't remember what year it was. But in this instance, you know, it's, we ended up with frozen ground and, and two inches of manure sitting on top, um, which is a really, um, a really generally a dangerous situation um, when we're talking about temperature fluctuation, um, especially the ones that we've had recent years in uh, in winter time, you can really end up with a big mess. Um, so planning ahead, thinking about how we're going to incorporate or not, or whether we should even apply, those are all things to consider. Um, so monitoring, um, talking about tile, concentrated surface flow, as uh, as CLM, um, and uh, as well as permitted facilities with manure application, you're required to monitor tile outlets and concentrated surface flows. These pictures here are not of discharges. Just sort of showing, um, you know, the volume that can be passing through, and also um, a, a, a very significant rain event that led to this um, on the bottom here. Um, just showing how how much material can get moved uh, just with uh, a single rain event and um, and a lot of water. So uh, monitoring um, before, during, and after your application. If you've got tile plugs or shutoff structures, you want to utilize those every every way and every time that you can. Um, we do have quite a few permitted facilities that use center pivots or traveling guns to apply. Um, and in most cases, I, I think the feeling there is that 
you're not putting that much material out and it's on a growing crop. Um, but those times in July and August when it's extremely dry and, uh, and you get soil cracking, um, you can definitely see, and we have seen in the past, um, manure find its way through those cracks, even though it's really dry, um, through those cracks, straight subsurface tile, um, and then discharging into a ditch or a creek. And so, um, in a lot of cases, people, uh, facility farms will just, um, they'll just go and plug tile and, um, or, or utilize their shutoff structures. A lot of people are, um, investing in those and, um, and putting those in because they're they're quite easy to use. Um, so they'll just they'll keep those shut most of the summer if we're not getting rain, and um, and that way they can avoid any any type of uh, any type of discharge. Um, you can go by especially those boxes. You can take the lids off and, and poke your head in there and see if um, see if you have an issue um, before you open it. So it, it it allows some of those opportunities to uh, to avoid to avoid a discharge. Um, this is an instance, um, kind of a unique instance. We had a, um, we had a facility that had, um, basically it's a, like a traveling pivot. You drag it from one riser to the next. And while they ran it, um, on one of the risers, they had a cap blow off of another riser. Um, but they failed, uh, failed to monitor the ditches, the tiles, and the risers in the fields, and they ended up with a fairly significant discharge. And um, and it took it took quite a while to figure out what was happening, and eventually we found this in the middle of the field where that cap blew off. And so um, so this is why monitoring is crucial to avoiding discharges. This could have been stopped um, well well before it hit the ditch and the creek. Um, so this monitoring, understanding who's going to monitor. Um, a lot of these um, large commercial outfits got a lot of pieces moving, a lot of people doing a lot of different things. Um, but um, but really being clear on on your expectations of who's going to be monitoring things and keeping an eye on on stuff is really important. So keep that in mind. Um, keep that in mind in the future. Um, and again, that goes back to knowing. Each uh, each unique site that you're at, you know where are the tile outlets, um, where are the catch basins, where are all those things that we need to be monitoring. So paying close attention to that and being prepared, um, being prepared for for when you get out there is important. So um, frozen snow covered ground um, as CLM as permitted facilities, um, the answer is 99.9 percent .9 always going to be no, don't do it. Um, I got a few pictures here that just kind of shows an example of an issue. That we had um, in the background, um, we're farther away from the camera here. Um, you can see this was a poultry litter application. Um, now they applied the poultry litter and it melted a bunch of the snow on out there. So maybe you would say that doesn't look snow covered by the time we got there. But in the foreground, you can see there's a there's a pretty good layer of snow um, on the ground, and so we would consider that to be um, snow covered. And um, what happened in this instance was they applied they applied the litter. Um, it was frozen, and uh, a day or so later, um, I think this was uh, probably in February, not this year, um, a couple years ago. Um, we had a warming event. It was about 55, 60 degrees about two days after this, and it and it rained for the it rained the entire day, and then which eventually then turned to snow. Um, and so this was a I tried to get my soil probe in the ground and it made it you can see um, there's about an inch inch and a half of thawed material thawed soil here that I could get through and then this bottom section is is just kind of a frozen plug that I was able to get in the bottom and so the top inch or so thawed um, but none of the water was able to continue to seep through the ground so we ended up with um, with just ponding water and I got a you'll see in the next photo as well, um, just concentrated surface flow all over uh, these application sites. And so this is a picture um, when we kind of tried to work out, okay, was it frozen? Was it not? What are we doing about this? The farmer went out and tried to show that he could incorporate it. But once again, just similar to that last picture, one of the last pictures that I showed, you can see sort of where his disc 
scratch the top inch, it didn't really turn anything over. It didn't, it didn't mix the manure with the soil. Um, it, it, this would not, this is, this would not and was not considered to be incorporated. Now you can see in the background here, it, there's quite a bit of material that's turned over. Oops, sorry. Quite a bit of material that's turned over and that just happened to be where the stockpile was sitting. So the ground was warm. They were able to, to get in, you know, get the disc in the ground there. Um, but the rest of the application side is, is cool as it is. So, so we ended up with um, concentrated surface flow. You can see all of this water here is, is this dark brown color. Um, and that's how that discharge happened. Um, coming out the tile. And this was, um, I wanted to make a, a, a distinction here. I thought this was a good photo because I've had, I've had some, um, I've had some people be a little bit confused about kind of what they're actually really looking for um, in the ditch. Um, you can see at the bottom of the photo, that's sediment. That's, um, you know, sediment that has washed off the surface. It's dirt. But here where the tile is, you can see the different color. This is the manure that's, um, that's come out of the tile. And so when you're monitoring, you've got to know what you're actually looking for. Um, is it manure laden or is it sediment laden? And so I think this picture demonstrates or, or shows pretty clearly the difference. Um, you know, manure laden water is going to be, um, it's going to be that dark, more like a chocolate colored, almost, um, though much less appetizing, obviously. Um, and where sediment laden water is, is always going to be kind of that lighter brown. Um, and so this shows the difference. And so monitoring is important, but if we don't know what we're looking for, um, then, then it's kind of pointless. So, so hopefully this gives you a, a pretty clear idea of visually um, what you can expect um, to see sediment versus manure in the water. Um, so again, another photo, just real quick. Um, concentrated surface flow, you can see the foam that started to build up here. This ended up washing um, into somebody's pond and then through a pasture and into the ditch. And, um, and then again, uh, this is another this is a culvert that went under the road. You can see all of the foam that was building up here. So um, all of this could have very, very simply been avoided um, by just not being out there. Um, again, going back to that planning part, you know, let's let's take a minute, slow down. I know, you know, everybody's got to go, go, go. But if we if we slow down and and really um, really plan ahead and think about um, all of these factors before we go out and apply manure, we can really, uh, really avoid some issues. And so um, I think, and with this particular instance, I think, you know, people might say, well, there, it was, you know, all of these factors led to, you know, this very unique situation where we had a discharge. You know, the chances of this happening again probably really slim. And my argument to that is um, two weeks after this happened, uh, the same guy went out and did the same thing, applied more poultry litter to frozen, snow-covered ground. Again, two days, two or three days later, it warmed up. It didn't rain, but all of the snow and the ice melted from that field, and, the, you know, same deal. About an inch down, it was still frozen. Everything just ran off the surface. And so it, it doesn't always have to coincide uh, with a rain event or a snow event, um, it's just a matter of the fact that in the winter time you end up with all of this litter or all of this manure just sitting, camping out on the surface, just kind of waiting for something to happen. And so understanding that, planning ahead for that um, is really, really crucial. Um, and so um, there's something just to keep in mind when we're when we're thinking about um, when we want to be out in the field. And so. Um, just quick rundown, um, last thoughts, again, equipment condition, making sure we're keeping up with that, giving ourselves um, the best opportunities to be successful with, um, um, with how our equipment is, is operating. Um, and then just planning ahead, you know, thinking about setbacks, finding those, those key areas in each field that you need to watch out for, you know, um, considering available water capacity, soil condition, um, residue coverage, all kinds of stuff like that when we're talking about rates. Um, and then the, monitor, the monitoring piece, and more importantly, understanding what we're looking for 
when we're monitoring um, is, is going to be key in avoiding um, potential issues and then avoiding the, uh, the frozen and snow cover ground conditions is, is, um, is a huge piece to this. And so um, happy to take a couple questions before I hop off here uh, if anybody, anybody's got any. Thanks, Luke. That was great. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Luke, <clears throat> for Luke real quick, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Otherwise, I can ask one real quick, and then we'll let him hop off. Sure. Um, I'm not seeing any come in right now, so I just have one question. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you were talking about Appendix A, Appendix B, some of these documents that farmers, growers, or applicators could um, consult. Where would someone go to find these documents, or who would they need to talk to? Um, all of the so all of those appendices they're in our rules, and all of those rules are online. Um, so really, any any laws or rules in the state of Ohio, you can find them online at codes.ohio.gov. Um, which really, I mean, you, you should just be able to Google um, Ohio Administrative Code, and and it will and it'll uh, it should be the top hit. Um, but the um, so chapter nine hundred one is in the Ohio Administrative Code is where all of our all of our rules are uh, for CLMs and permitted facilities as well. Um, so a quick Google search will get you there, um, and then the appendices are. Um, if there are any to any of the rules, they're down at the, at the bottom of the page if you scroll down. Awesome. That's actually pretty easy to find if anyone needs to. Um, I haven't seen any questions <laughs> come in, so we can let you hop off then. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, up next we will have um, John Flegel. And um, John, do you need me to share my screen to show? your aids um i think we're good um okay. if videos don't work then i can just talk through the uh the safety and the secure process um it's actually fairly uh fairly you know easily to understand without any photographs or videos but if anyone has any you know questions or concerns then they can definitely you know ask not a problem so <clears throat> Okay. Um, I might just put the picture on the screen then, and you can go ahead and start talking whenever you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so just to say again, uh, my name is John Fligum with Ohio EPA in the Office of Response. Uh, I cover 24 counties uh, within the, uh, the Northwest Ohio District Office. And um, at this point, when we get involved or when I get involved, the, uh, the incident has gone beyond, you know, the normal control measures of being able to you know, stop the release and it's already done its damage into the, uh, into the environment. So that's usually when I come into play, um, just to bring it in context of some of the other responses that I do. Uh, I do respond to air releases, different type of chemical releases. Train derailments is probably, you know, the, the, the best example of what we respond to. So every so I know that it's been iterated before in past training events, uh, with these type of incidents or spills that, you know, by the time that people find out that the emergency has occurred, that there's a lot of um, fatigue, frustration, stress levels get pretty high up there. And so I try to, I try to keep a, a calm and a collected manner. So that way it doesn't add on to the stress that already has been within the environment. Um, I believe that when it comes with being able to work safely and try to um, not get anybody hurt, I believe that that's probably the best way to approach some of these incidents. So that way we can try to come up with a good game plan in a calm, collected manner. So that way it's, you know, well thought out and a well thought out process. So uh, with that being said, I do think that it's important to keep in mind that when we do these responses that um, I do think about the importance of work rest cycles. Um, if, you know, depending on the magnitude of the spill, whether it's in a waterway or a dry ditch, um, we do take in consideration of the magnitude of the actual 
incident and how it actually looks and impacts the environment uh, in terms of you know how often someone should be working and help and any helpers that they have to be able to help them because eventually fatigue is going to set in and that's where we make the most mistakes that we have is the slip trips and falls um you know not you know you know nothing else you know is really more important than to make sure that even though we're in the uh, the emergency stage of these in type of environmental pollution incidents that we don't try to, we minimize the amount of injuries that are out there. Um, if we are to use a um, aeration device, whether it's using a trash pump or a bubbler or anything of that manner, um, it's very important to, you know, try to find easy access um, roadways that aren't very, uh, that doesn't have a, a lot of high traffic because we don't want to get it, anybody hit, you know, on the side of the road. Um, overpass bridges are usually my favorite areas to try to place any type of equipment, whether it's this, you know, example of a picture of the straw dam that I had, that we had one of the individuals placed or in a silage release that we had here just recently, a couple months ago, um, or anything else that could be set up. So, you know, anything that's easy access, low traffic, high visibility is really important. And that really comes in the terms of working at night. Um, I've had questions before to me because every single time we come up with ideas and uh, plan of actions of the timeline and the progression of the actual incident and trying to remediate and try to make the environment better, I always get asked, do we have to work 24 hours, seven days a week? And again, that goes into fatigue and work rest cycle and as well as visibility. The last thing I would want is anybody to get hit on the side of the road because, you know, it was dark, there was low visibility, not enough light, or someone trips and falls and, you know, they don't have anyone they can call or able to contact to because sometimes uh, phone reception is not the best in some of these areas that they're not able to call someone for help in case they get hurt. So those are all considerations that we do take and can, that we do think about whenever we have these type of incidents. Um, if we are to put a plug, like a tile plug, I always ask, do we know, you know, I always ask, do we know where all of our drainage goes to? Um, just like Glenn talked about in his beginning part of his presentation, where there was a tile that was used for a plug and then it ended up going into another ditch. That's also something that I always think about too. If we are to try to make one area better, we don't want to create another potential problem down the road. I've had tile plugs that, and you know, I'm, I'm not personally, but we've had tile plugs in experience in the past where it has backed up in other people's basements because they were tied in. Um, just as an example, and that wasn't a manure related response, that was other, um, other things that we go out to for spills. So it is always important to know, you know, your drainage and also think about the uh, potential repercussions if we are to plug a tile. I'm not saying that it's not the best method given the situation and the current circumstances, but we do have to think about those kinds of things too. Um, also being able to make sure that we tie off certain equipment so that way they don't float away and you lose it. And also try to secure it the best you can so that way um, nothing blows out and you know hits you because unfortunately sometimes we may come into situations and have come to situations where some of these plugs end up blowing out and then they just end up hitting someone and that's something that we want to avoid as well too so um again thinking about the magnitude of the situation i've had a manure tanker that was tipped over on its side from a rollover accident and it went into a dry ditch you know technically you know, considers waters of the state, but because it was a dry ditch, 70 degrees, nice and sunny, no rain in sight. Um, that was one of, you know, that was one of those situations where we could take things, you know, a little bit slow and being able to get stuff cleaned up appropriately without anyone getting injured or hurt, especially on the side of the road. So that one was easily cleaned up by just using a, uh, a uh, simple sump pump attachment and putting into another tanker. And um, and then that was really it. So, so of course, again, the magnitude of the situation is really going to, um, it's really going to de 
it's really going to dictate, you know, the level of responsiveness that we should probably take in consideration when it comes with work rest cycle, fatigue, time management, um, and making sure that no one just gets generally just gets hurt in any of these situations. So let's see. Um, with that being said, uh, at seven minutes and 30 seconds. So um, again, if anyone has any questions, concerns, uh, definitely, you know, I'm here available to anybody. Thanks, John. Uh, again, if anybody has questions for either speaker at this point, um, we can take any questions. I will begin sharing my screen again. So this is the time for questions, if anyone has any. I really appreciate all the speakers for talking. If you do have any questions and for some reason you don't want to ask them over Zoom, that's completely fine. I have email addresses listed for everyone here. The first email address is mine. Um, if you have any questions about the webinar or our team, feel free to contact me. Or you could reach out to the entire Water Quality Associates team. That second email address goes to all of us if you don't know who to contact or you're trying to figure out what, you, what area you'd want you're in. You could reach out to all of us. Other than that, the speakers are in order of my email addresses. So first is Glenn's, then is Luke's, and then is John's if you would need to reach out for with them for anything. Um, oh, I actually have a, <laughs> I have a typo. The email address is Arnold.2. Um, and as you can see, Rachel, one of the other water quality associates put in the link to the Water Quality Wednesday registration in the chat if anybody's interested in that. Um, not seeing any um questions come in yet. I can ask a couple if no one else will. Um, my first one is to Glenn. You showed a bunch of nice equipment, a bunch of um just possibilities for farmers if they have a spill, what they, what they can have. Um, how what is the range of like the economics of this? Is it very does it range for something cheap? Is there some obviously some of these are expensive solutions? Um, if a farmer's trying to look at the economics of this, what does it look like? Well, a lot of it on the economics uh, depends on how quickly they can get their spills uh, contained and, and the mitigation process started. Uh, but again, you will have investigation fees and Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, has investigation fees if they're called out. Uh, perhaps your wildlife officer might be involved. There could be investigation fees there and also the EPA. So. I don't think farmers really need to buy a lot of tile plugs because you can get those from soil and water offices. Some, if, as long as you're planning ahead, soil and water offices may have them. Commercial manure applicators carry a lot of tile plugs. So you've got that. A trash pump like I demo, demoed is something that a lot of people keep handy anyhow for pumping out house basements and things like that. So it's, it's, it's more or less, uh, it's a matter of having um, knowledge of where the equipment's at, not necessarily buying all but yourself. So, but a manure spill is easily, oftentimes you'll see if, it, if you do a really, really good job and you're not a, a um, perennial polluter, you still can look at 10 grand pretty fast for for um, investigation fees and, and uh, stuff like that. Well, it's good to know, even though you never wanted a spill to happen. And then I have one other question for John, and then I'll move on because I know a lot of people are interested in here for our CLM and CCA credits. Um, so John, I know you talked a lot about fatigue, which is obvious in any situation. If it's a very stressful situation and you have to go out, go out and do this for hours on end to prevent manure from getting into waterways, you're going to start to feel tired. What do you recommend to people to try and avoid just this oh, too much fatigue in these situations? Uh, try to get as much help as you can. Also think about, you know, um, you know, again, the magnitude of the situation. If we have an aerator pump that can be used and unmanned, you know, for example, like a trash pump or anything like that, and doesn't really need a lot of oversight, then that gives, you know, that frees up that individual of being able to, you know, do the other tasks that they, that they need to do. Um, we also understand that even though we're going through this emergency, there's still daily things that have to be done in order for them in order for them to continue to operate. We do that with every everybody that we work with. Um, that's something that we keep in mind too. But you know, that's the only really the best recommendation that we can really come up with is you know try to see if you can get any additional extra hands that you can possibly get. 
Um, sometimes we, you know, we've had to reach out to a couple of contracting agencies that handle the con these kinds of releases. Um, that's, you know, usually it's a very long conversation, you know, very uh, mutual conversation that I usually have with my ODA folks or someone from local and soil water district on looking at the local capability that each individual has. And that really comes down and a lot of that, you know, comes in the factors such as, you know, where can we take this product, you know, to get, you know, to get properly applied, you know, is so, and then also do they have the right equipment and the right supervision oversight and also the technical, uh, you know, expertise to be able to do it. So sometimes there were, there were very rare occasions that we had to have a separate company come out that does this stuff that does this on a regular basis to do that. So that's other, that's another option. Of course, we don't say that you have to hire someone, you know, you know, we just say, you know, this is, you know, we have to do X, Y, and Z and however we're able to do it, then, you know, we can get it accomplished. So um, there are times that sometimes we don't find out where it came from. Um, some of the spills that we go to, you know, has been so old that it's hard to really trace back and verify, you know, which which land application or which farm field it, you know, it came out of um, because, you know, my investigation when it comes with a notice of violation is do I see the discharge actively coming out from this facility? And if I can't verify that, then it's hard for me to, you know, uh, cite anyone for that. Um, so we do come out with our own equipment, our own tile plugs, things like that, you know, to, you know, to kind of mitigate what we can do if we can't, especially if we can't find where it came from originally, so. Yeah, it, it sounds like there's a lot of options. If so, if someone would have this happen, um, it sounds like they can reach out to their local soil and water mostly, or even as you other agencies. Um, I'm going to continue on our slides because I know a lot of people are here for CCA credits. So this is the CCA credits. If you have the app, um, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. It should work. And then if you don't have the app, that's fine as well. Um, you can email me if you want to get your name added to the list to get those CCA credits. And then I will launch the poll as well for our CLM credits. Um, just answer yes if you need CLM credits. We submit those names. And then I just have one more question while people are getting their credits. And then this is for either John or Glenn, both, either or both of you can answer. Um, you both talked about different things in the event of a manure spill, kind of just to get all encompassing aspects. What is the recommendation from each of you? Where would you start? What is the first thing if a farmer notices they have a manure spill? What is the first thing they need to do or who is the first thing they need to contact? Well, I'll start on that, Amber. First thing you wanna do is you wanna stop the source. You wanna stop wherever the manure is coming from. And if it's already stopped, then you can move on to the second thing, but you wanna get that first one stopped or the first step is to get the source uh, stopped. Then secondly, you want to look at contain. Um, you're there, you're on site. You really can't expect a uh, somebody else to show up uh, from an office in, in uh, less than 30 minutes probably to help out. So you're there, you're on site, you need to start getting your containment uh, put in place. If that's simply keeping it on the field, great. If that's keeping it in the ditch, great, but whatever it is, we need to work on that containment. And then eventually, you know, hopefully you've got neighbors or friends or, or uh, family members that can help you with uh, with mitigation. So, but getting this, the manure source stopped is your number one thing. And Glenn's absolutely correct on that. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. That's a that's probably the best situation. The probably best advice you can give it is stop it, and then from there, um, that's when you start calling people or figuring out what else you need to do. Stopping is probably the big, biggest thing you need to do. Um, beyond that, it's I have. I was just gonna say it's a very stressful time for everybody. Yes, um, I think uh, all three of our speakers talked about stress, fatigue, um, just the anxiety that can come in a spill situation. And then thanks everyone for being here. Um, I should have that poll relaunched uh, because I did notice it closed too soon. If you need to respond to that, 
um, because we'll get your UCLM credits. If you don't think um, you got it in or you didn't answer, feel free to, um, and Rachel just said it in the chat, feel free to um, send us the chat or email us if you need your credits or you're worried about getting them. Other than you, that. Um, can you back that up for the CCA credits? <laughs> yes, of course. There you go, Glenn. Other than that, that's everything for today. We thank you for joining us.